oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, a year ago, the Minister of Finance said there would be deflation in Canada. She promised prices would go down for Canadian families. Instead, we've seen groceries go up 15 to 20 percent. We've seen gas go up 40 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've seen housing, rent, mortgages go up 20 to 30 percent. She misled Canadians with the deflation promise. And today, in the mandate letter for the Minister of Finance, no mention of the inflation crisis. Why? Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the person who is misleading Canadians when it comes to the economy is the leader of the opposition. Here are the facts. Our GDP grew by 5.4% in the third quarter. We have recovered 106% of the jobs lost to the pandemic. As Stephen Pelos, the central banker appointed by Mr. Harper put it over the weekend, aren't we lucky that the policies worked well to prevent the second Great Depression, which is what economists worried about when we first encountered COVID? That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the reality is the Minister of Finance was the first Canadian politician to ever be flagged for misleading Canadians online, Mr. Speaker. It is quite rich for that minister to suggest other people are misleading Canadians when she has been flagged just like Donald Trump was, Mr. Speaker. So it's almost the end of the year. It's almost the end of the year. I will give the minister the opportunity to apologize to Canadians for misleading them during the federal election. Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me take this opportunity to allow the Leader of the Opposition to stop flip-flopping and to choose an economic lane, something his caucus might appreciate too. Today, the Conservatives are complaining about government spending, but on the campaign trail, they proposed a deficit of $168 billion for 21-22. In the fall economic update, we showed a deficit for that year of $144.5 billion, 23.5 billion lower than what the Conservatives proposed. So could the leader of flip-flops please let Canadians know what he really stands for? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I would note Donald Trump doesn't apologize either. Oh! Mr. Speaker, the cost of living crisis is the worst it's been in decades. It's a disaster. Some families have to choose between heating and eating this winter. And wages are not rising. Mr. Speaker, it's unacceptable. Do the Liberals understand the choices Canadians are having to make because of their inflation? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Voici les Here are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Our GDP grew by 5.4% in the third quarter. We have recovered 106% of the jobs lost. And as Stephen Pollaz said, who was appointed by Stephen Harper, we are fortunate that policies worked well to avoid the second Great Depression, as feared by economists when we were faced with the COVID shock. That's the fact, Mr. Speaker. Volpeck could have asked, asked the Prime Minister a question of the potato crisis and PEI yesterday. Didn't do it. Nope. The Liberal member from Cardigan had this message for island farmers. No matter what happens, the government can help, but farmers will lose. He's right. Under the Liberals, farmers always lose. Yeah. The PEI Premier is questioning why the Agriculture Minister isn't in Washington. Maybe it's because resolving this dispute isn't even in her mandate letter. Why isn't the Agriculture Minister in Washington putting all her potato chips on the table and resolving this dispute? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me assure 
all farmers across our amazing country, very much including the farmers in PEI, that our government is extremely focused on supporting farmers in general and on supporting farmers when it comes to this trade issue. I was sitting next to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, when he raised this issue directly with the President of the United States. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to standing up to the U.S. Canadians know they back down from the Americans in a fight. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Members are very thankful the Liberals will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to Canadian agriculture. I spoke to PEI farmers this morning and one of them had to say this. With the stroke of a pen, the Liberals have destroyed everything I've worked for for six generations. And now the Agriculture Minister is saying this dispute will not be resolved until the new year. Sure. But CFIA is telling island farm families this half-baked ban will likely last until 2023. How many harvests will be lost? How many businesses will be bankrupt? How many farmers will lose before this minister lifts this political ban on potato exports? Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me once again say to Canadian farmers that they should not listen to the scaremongering they're hearing from Conservatives. They need to know that our government cares passionately about Canadian farmers. We know the importance of family farms to our economy. And let me also remind Canadian farmers that our government is prepared to stand up for the national interest when it comes to trade with the United States. Canadian farmers know that from the cool dispute we had right after we were first elected in 2015. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, secularism and Bills 21 are being attacked by a united front at the federal level, including elected officials from all parties, starting with the Prime Minister himself. But what's worse is that this united front is spreading falsehoods. The secularism of the state is not discriminatory. It applies to everyone. Ms. Anvery didn't lose her job. She was reassigned. And she wasn't reassigned because of her religion, but because she knowingly broke the law. When will the government stop spreading these Quebec bashing falsehoods? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, we disagree with Bill 21. In our society, no one should have to change jobs because of their religion. That is the position of our government and of our party. We agree with Quebecers who are standing up for their rights before the courts because they too find this legislation unfair. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, it keeps going. It's so funny, Mr. Speaker. Canadian cities are now climbing on the Quebec bashing bandwagon. Yesterday, it was Brampton that announced funding to challenge Bill 21, calling Quebecers racists along the way. Today, it's Toronto that's getting on board. The worst part is they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't understand secularism, and they don't understand Bill 21. Not least because elected officials here in Ottawa are spreading falsehoods. Instead of using ideology to smear Quebecers, will the government announce that it respects our democratic choices and won't challenge them in court? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague from the Bloc for his question. It's true, I'm a member from Toronto, and I was born in Alberta. But I do want to sincerely say to Bloc members and to all Quebecers that our government is working closely with the government of Quebec and the municipalities in Quebec and even with Bloc members to support Quebecers. Don't try to pick a fight between us and Quebec City, please. Mr. Burnaby. Today, there are more than uh, 2,007 COVID cases in Quebec alone, even with new restrictions to avoid the spread. 
This suggests that people, once again, will lose their jobs. But this time, there's nothing to support them. No CERB, no CRB, no wage subsidy for small businesses. How can this government cut this urgent assistance when we're facing what could be the worst part of the pandemic? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Je veux sincèrement... I'd like to sincerely thank my colleague for his question because... I truly believe that COVID is the most serious issue we face today. And that's why I hope all members will support Bill C-2. That bill will create the support people need and companies need in case there's another lockdown, precisely because we agree with the NDP member that those supports are necessary. So I hope all members will vote in favour of Bill C-2. The Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Cases are increasing everywhere, and people are already gearing up for a reduced limit of people in stores and restaurants to limit the spread. This means people will once again be out of work. Except for this time, there is nothing to help them. No serve for workers, no wage subsidy for small businesses. How can this government cut help for people when we're up against possibly the worst of this pandemic? Hey. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would really like to thank uh, the member opposite for that important question. I think that COVID is the greatest challenge facing Canada today, and that's why I focused on it in the economic and fiscal update. And I agree with him that we need to have support measures in place for people in businesses in the event of additional lockdowns. That's why I urge all members of this House to support Bill C-2. It would create precisely those tools. We need them. I really hope all members will support this bill. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess it's throwback Thursday. The Silence of the Lambs and the Beauty and the Beast were on the big screen. Brian Adams, I do it for you, topped the charts. Mushroom cuts were in vogue, and the World Wide Web was first introduced to the public. That was the last time inflation was this high. That was 30 years ago. When will the Prime Minister realize that his disastrous policies are to blame for our record-breaking inflation? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's ignore conservative scaremongering and look at the global facts. In the U.S., November inflation was 6.8 percent, an increase from October. In Germany, November inflation was 6 percent, an increase from October. In the UK, November inflation 5.1%, an increase from October. Meanwhile, in Canada, inflation is lower than in all of these countries and did not increase from October to November. Honourable member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadian families are already being pushed to the limit and are having a hard time making ends meet. Inflation is at 4.7 percent, the highest level since 1991, and the Prime Minister doesn't consider monetary policy a priority. When will the Prime Minister take the time to think about monetary policy? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, we all agree that the cost of living is a challenge. But I'm not hearing a lot of solutions coming from the Conservatives. So let me suggest one. Let's support all Canadians working in tourism. Let's support all workers who work in restaurants. And let's support all of the hardest hit companies in Canada by supporting Bill C-2. For Hastings, Lennox and Addington. <laughs> Minister continues to mislead Canadians by arguing that our economy is strong. That may be the case for some, but the conversations around the kitchen tables in rural Canada tell a very different story. That's right. Bills are piling up and credit cards are maxed. Just inflation has Canadians at their breaking point financially and emotionally. 
When will this government take bold action to strengthen the economy and combat inflation instead of repeating tired old talking points? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government understands that to pay your bills, the single most important thing is to have a job or to keep your business afloat. And that's why when COVID hit, we took immediate action. We have recovered every single one of the 3 million lost jobs and more. And fewer businesses have gone bankrupt over the past year than in the year before COVID. Conservative austerity would have devastated the lives of millions of Canadians. We are proud to have acted decisively to save jobs and businesses. That's how you make life affordable, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure how she's talking, how that member is talking about making life affordable. Regardless, a job doesn't keep people from being hungry. One in eight people who visit food banks are employed. The growing costs of housing, rent, and grocery prices are affecting those struggling the most to make ends meet, particularly single parents. Over 30% of visitors at food banks in Canada are children. This is wrong, this is heartbreaking, and it needs to change now. When will these Liberals stop the just inflation crisis, which is hurting our most precious commodity, our children? The Honourable Minister. Take the Conservatives seriously when. Oh. We had a little bit of a glitch there. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's hard to take the Conservatives seriously that they care about single parents or children when they voted against the Canada Child Benefit. It's hard to take them seriously when they campaigned on getting rid of the Canada-wide early learning and child care system. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I missed the whole. I, I missed the whole answer. I'm going to ask, ask the Minister to repeat right from the start. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's very difficult to take the Conservatives seriously that they care about single parents and children when they voted against the Canada Child Benefit, which helped lift 400,000 Canadian children out of poverty. It's hard to take them seriously when they campaigned against getting rid of the Canada Early Learning and Child Care system. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, we are making a difference. Families right across this country are going to see a 50 percent reduction in fees as of January right through the end of this year, and that is going to help them with the cost of living, and it's going to make sure our kids get the very best possible start in life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Regina Luban. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, we gave this government an opportunity to do the right thing by Saskatchewan and remove a long-standing tax exemption in our Constitution. Rather than do the right thing and ensure that a large, profitable corporation pays their share of taxes, the Liberals decided to block our attempts to stand up for Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, I asked the Minister of Justice, can we work together to ensure that the people of Saskatchewan aren't left paying the bill for a sweetheart deal that was made over 150 years ago, or will the Liberals continue to ignore my province. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question and his concern on the issue. Mr. Speaker, we have agreed as a government to, to a take-note debate on this in February. Our objection yesterday, Mr. Speaker, was on the fact that one does not make a constitutional amendment on a UC motion without ever having discussed it or debated it in any forum in this House, Mr. Speaker. We respect Saskatchewan. We will do that take note debate and we will act accordingly. The Honourable Member for Regina Capel. Mr. Speaker, farmers depend on effective rail service. They can't get paid for their hard work if they can't ship their crops to market. Now, a foreign hedge fund is, has started a campaign to take over the board of CN Rail with a plan to make service cuts to maximize profit for shareholders. Farmers know what happens when services cut back in the interest of shareholders. Terminals can't get cars to load and ships sit empty waiting. When will the government take action to protect farmers, ensure healthy competition and reliable rail service? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to advocate for efficient and safe rail service. The fluidity and reliability of our supply chain is critical to our economy. I've been hearing about this ongoing situation with CN in the media and also in popular podcasts. CN is responsible for its own leadership decision. But let me assure you, Mr. Speaker, and assure my honorable colleague that our government will take action to continue to protect the interests of Canadians, the safety and reliability of our rail network to ensure fluid supply chains. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, the economic update isn't exactly historic, but it does say a lot about the Prime Minister's priorities. At the heart of this document is the promise of a fight with Quebec and the provinces over health care. Five days after all the Premiers demanded a meeting to negotiate an increase in funding, this Prime Minister announces that he will not agree to a single penny more until 2027. Why is the government picking a fight when everyone should be united in supporting our health care workers against Omicron. The Honourable uh, Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for raising this question. Instead of picking a fight, on the contrary, we're working in a cooperative fashion and have been over the past 21 months. I had another meeting with all my provincial counterparts the health ministers just last night, and it's important now to work together to avoid the looming crisis with the Omicron variant. We all agree on the importance of accelerating booster shots and making sure that rapid tests are available to people who need them. We're going to continue telling people that they have to follow public health guidelines because we want Canada to have the most, the soundest system in the world to get through this wave. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mr. Speaker, recent developments are a stark reminder that we're still in a health crisis while our health care system is still overwhelmed. And yet this week, despite Quebec's announcement of new restrictions, due to fears of the Omicron variant, despite Ottawa's recommendation to cancel travel plans, despite the fact that the Liberal Party has placed itself on telework, despite all that, the government presented an economic update in which it still refuses to increase health transfers before 2027. Is there anyone on the other side who can explain that to me? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my colleague gives me the opportunity to remind everyone of two very important things solidarity and the importance of federalism in recent months, without the cooperation of all levels of government, we would have had thousands of additional deaths. We would have suffered much greater economic losses, and the health and safety of millions of Canadians would have been further imperiled. So I'd like to thank everyone for their outstanding cooperativeness and it shows that the more we work together, the stronger we are and the further we will go. The Honourable Member for jean -Kier. Oh, well, that was impassioned. Mr. Speaker, no one's questioning the government's spending during the pandemic. The problem is that before the pandemic, they cut their share of health care funding year after year. Today, they're saying they're going to start cutting their share again, all the way until 2027. The Feds weren't doing their share yesterday, and now they're confirming they won't be doing their share tomorrow. This confirms they've learned no lessons from COVID, not even from exhausted health care personnel. It's exasperating, Mr. Speaker. How is it possible to be so insensitive to the reality in our health care facilities? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Merci, Monsieur le... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the Bloc should just take a second and acknowledge how much Canada stepped up for Quebec and they should recognize that we can work together, all with the federal government, with all the provinces. Eight out of ten dollars in spending in the pandemic were spent there. We've always been there for vaccines, rapid tests, PPE. We've always worked with Quebec, but it hurts the bloc too much to recognize that because all they want is squabble, squabble, squabble. Yesterday, we learned that housing inflation hit a record 25 percent. Bloomberg says we have the second biggest housing bubble in the world. But where is the money coming from? 
After all, the wages with which Canadians buy housing are down in real terms. The number of immigrants are also down. So to the Minister of Finance, if the number of people and the amount of wages needed to buy homes are down, and yet house prices are up, where is the money coming from? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Proud to be part of a government that has brought federal leadership back into the housing sector. We've invested over $27 billion since coming into office, brought in the National Housing Strategy, and brought in measures to help Canadians with housing supply, with access to affordable housing, with rent supports, and so on. But when the Conservatives had the opportunity to do the right thing last night by voting in a tax to, against uh, foreign home buyers, they voted against it. So, Mr. Speaker, they have no credibility on this issue. Well done. Honourable Member for Carlton. Well, the Finance Minister has gone into hiding on this uh, housing inflation question. Her officials tell Globe and Mail that she's been skipping her briefings, so perhaps she didn't have the answer. But I'll ask it again. Housing price inflation hit a record 25%. Yeah. Even though the wages with which Canadians buy housing is down, the GDP is still down from 2019 levels. So given that we have less wealth with which to buy housing, where is the money coming from? The Honourable Minister of Families. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we respect Canadians and we respect that Canadians need help with the high cost of living. Unfortunately, the member from Carleton refers to support for childcare as a slush fund for families. Mr. Speaker, that's offensive to families, it's offensive to children, and it's offensive to dealing with the very real high costs of living that Canadians are facing. But on this side of the House, we're going to be there to support Canadians, support families, and make sure they have the tools and the resources they need for success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Carlton. Well, I referred to their $100 billion of new and unnecessary spending as a slush fund. That is $6,600 in new costs for every single family in wow. Canada. Wow. And we know those families can't afford to pay it, even if the finance minister isn't hiding from this question. The reality is house prices are up 25%, the worst housing inflation on record and the second worst housing bubble in the world. So with wages actually down, meaning the money with which people buy houses has dropped, where is the money coming from? The Honourable Minister for Families. Appreciate if the member from Carleton would apologize to hardworking families for saying that support for childcare is akin to a slush fund, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the house, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to hear the answer, and it's just too much noise in here. And the honourable order, the honourable member for Carleton wants to hear what the response is. The honourable minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, it is on this side of the House that we understand that there is a high cost of living, and that is specifically why we are helping hardworking families with the high cost of childcare. It is specifically why we are helping hardworking families to access more affordable housing and housing affordability. Unfortunately, the members of opposite, opposite just don't get it and aren't proposing anything that would actually help Canadian families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Greasebuck. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Four years ago, the federal government promised funding for the LGBTQ Community Capacity Fund to help make up for decades of systemic discrimination. But it will run out of funding this March. This government can't expect to repair harm and discrimination with only one round of grants. They must keep their promise. Will the Liberals give the 2SLGBTQI community the long-term, stable financial support we need? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, we, as a government, have always, always stood up for the right of the LGBTQ2 community domestically and abroad. Uh, we always consult with the community on, on ways to increase the capacity of community organizations, including in the LGBTQ2 community, to serve 
more Canadians uh, and to serve uh, fellow community members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well done. Well, member for Esquimalt, Saanich Souk. Mr. Speaker, in addition to falling short on funding capacity building for 2S LGBTQI organizations in Canada, the Liberals are also failing to do their part to defend our rights abroad. This in an increasingly dangerous world where in countries like Afghanistan, being queer is now literally a death sentence. One simple and effective step that community advocates and New Democrats have been calling for since 2015 would be the appointment of a Canadian special envoy for LGBTQ rights. Will the government act now in this time of crisis in places like Afghanistan and appoint a Canadian special envoy to help advance and protect LGBTQ rights around the world? Sure. The Honourable Minister for Families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank my honourable colleague for what is a very important question. In my former position as Minister of International Development, I was very pleased to be able to work with him and advocates around this country and around the world to ensure that Canada was playing its part to protect and support the LGBTQ LGBTQ2 plus community right around the world. We know that there are so many places around the world where it is not safe to be who you are and to love who you are. And I am very pleased to continue to do this work and to ensure that we are providing that support, that protection here at home and right around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for London West. Mr. Speaker, last year our government launched its first ever Black Entrepreneurship Program to help Black Canadian business owners and entrepreneurs. Yesterday, we took another step in supporting Black Canadians as we made an announcement about the Black Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub component of the program. Could the Minister of Small Business and Economic Development inform the House on how the Knowledge Hub will benefit and empower Black entrepreneurs and business owners across the country. And I also would like to take this moment to wish her a happy birthday. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> our government firmly believes in creating a strong and more inclusive economy. I was very proud to announce this week the establishment of the Black Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, a partnership between Carleton University and the Dream Legacy Foundation. Once operational, the, the Knowledge Hub will conduct research and collect data on black entrepreneurship in Canada and identify barriers to success as well as opportunities to help black Canadian business owners grow their business. We're excited and we're looking forward to the outcome and the great work that the Knowledge Hub is going to be doing. Abbotsford. Canada must say no to Huawei. Yesterday, the Washington Post reported that Huawei is promoting facial and voice recognition software that helps them track shoppers, helps them monitor political dissidents, and manage re-education camps. This is appalling. Yet while Canada's most trusted allies are, are banning Huawei from their networks, our government refuses to act. So again to the minister, when will the minister say no way to Huawei? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable colleague for the question. He knows that one of the priority of this government is to keep our network safe, Mr. Speaker. We know that the network is one of the most critical infrastructure for now and for generations to come. And an experienced member like him would understand that when you're taking a decision like that, the lens which you look at that is national security, Mr. Speaker. We understand that on this side of the House. I wish colleagues would understand as well. Merci. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Three years this government promised to have a decision within a few weeks. <laughs> Our own intelligence agencies have warned this Prime Minister against allowing Huawei into our 5G networks. Turns out they were right. For years, Huawei denied that it was a tool of the communist regime in Beijing. Now we have evidence that the company is deeply implicated in designing surveillance tools to keep track of millions, if not billions, of people around the world. Is that acceptable to this minister? And will he make a decision on Huawei before the year end? Yes, sir. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for what is a very important question because he is a very senior member on the other side of the aisle. He understands this issue, Mr. Speaker. Like Canadians are watching, they understand.
I'll let the I'll let the minister continue. Yes or no, minister. So we can the honourable minister for innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank you for uh, making sure I can continue to explain to my esteemed colleague the importance of the network in Canada. And Mr. Speaker, Canadians were watching. We're just uh, before Christmas. They're watching this question period, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure one thing that they understand is that we on this side of the aisle we understand what national security is about, and we will make the right decision for this generation and future generation. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, how much more evidence does the Prime Minister need to ban Huawei? This week, the Washington Post reported that Huawei was marketing its technologies to governments on the basis that it can identify individuals by voice and monitor political individuals of interest. The Prime Minister knows that under the Chinese Communist regime, companies must share information with the government if necessary. By using that technology in Canada, that means that Canadian information would be placed at the disposal of the Chinese Communist government. Will the Prime Minister commit to making a decision on Huawei by the end of the year? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his important question. Mr. Speaker, he is familiar with issues of national security. Therefore, he will understand that when it comes to the telecom network, Mr. Speaker, we know how important the network is, both today and for coming generations. My colleague understands that. Quebecers and Canadians watching us throughout the country today know that this government takes national security seriously. Mr. Speaker, we will make the best decision in the interest of Canada. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, indeed, I care about national security issues. And when it comes to the Five Eyes Group, four out of five decided to ban Huawei because it's a threat. Why can't Canada realize that it should do the same thing? It shouldn't allow Huawei for 5G, especially based on the evidence that we saw in the Washington Post this week. Huawei is using the information to spy on citizens, and it can send that information to the, to the Chinese Communist Party. When will the Prime Minister make a decision? Will it be by the end of the year? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his important question. Canadians watching us today before Christmas understand the importance of the telecommunications network. I greatly respect my colleague. He, he very well understands the importance of national security. And so I am sure that he wants us to make the very best decision in the interest of Canadians, placing national security above other concerns, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Montalville. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to COVID-19, science is clear. Globally, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We are dealing with new variants that have emerged in countries with overly low vaccination uh, levels due to a lack of resources. This is not rocket science. We need to waive patent, patents for vaccines so that developing countries can procure and produce them. Ottawa should also support logistic support when necessary. Will this government put pressure on government and industry? <clears throat> oh. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci à mon collègue de poser cette. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for this important question. This is one of the tools we are considering, but right now, we need to focus on double and triple vaccination for eligible Canadians. We know that a severe Omicron uh, wave is starting. Internationally, we have already promised 200 million vaccine doses to be delivered by the end of 2022, 2022 as well as a $2.5 billion commitment to developing countries to help them administer these vaccines as quickly as possible. The Honourable Member for Montalville, Mr. Speaker, the government doesn't seem to understand that variants are developing because there is a lack of vaccination throughout the world. Currently, Negotiations are stalled regarding vaccine patent waivers in developing countries. Canada's passivity is endangering entire populations, and it is making these countries an involuntary potential source of variants, instead of enabling them to produce vaccines that would increase the vaccination level of the entire world. 
Will this government commit to putting pressure on the international stage, specifically at the WTO, so that rich countries and their pharma companies can finally waive these patents? Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that really important question. And let me just be very clear. Our government has always been and will always be a strong advocate for vaccine equity. Canada is taking leadership at the WTO to work with the international community to making sure that the global trading system contributes to removing... One moment, I believe we have uh, the Honourable Deputy de la Prairie. On n'entend pas la traduction en français, Monsieur le Président. Je suis désolé. French interpretation is not currently audible. The Honourable Minister will start over. Through, as we, oui, ça fonctionne. Uh, so, if uh, the Honourable Minister can start over again, so that uh, they can be heard in both official languages. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, let me thank my honourable colleague for that really important question. And let me be clear that our government has always been and will always be a strong advocate for equity in vaccine to everywhere around the world. Canada is taking leadership at the WTO, working with the international community to make sure that the global trading system can contribute to removing barriers to vaccine access. I just had a meeting with Ottawa group members this morning. We're advancing issues like it includes IP, but it actually also includes supply chain, production, export uh, restrictions. Our government's going to continue doing this very important work with the international community. Well, member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, I had the privilege of speaking to a grade 10 civics class this morning in my riding to Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. So I asked for their feedback on Bill C-5. They'd like to know if the government is willing to amend the bill and keep mandatory minimums for, one, extortion with a firearm, two, importing and exporting or possession of drugs for the purpose of exporting, and three, the production of hard drugs, i.e. heroin, cocaine, fentanyl, and crystal meth. Yeah, yeah. In their opinion, these serious c crimes make sense with mandatory minimums. If these kids get it, why doesn't the government? There is the Honorable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, what this government does get is that mandatory minimum penalties have been an abject failure in all regards. They don't work. They don't. They don't work to to uh, increase or, or decrease criminality. They don't work to decrease recidivism. And all they do is clog up the criminal justice system, cause delays, and have a serious disproportionate impact on systemic racism. Mr. Speaker, serious crimes in our system will always carry serious consequences. All of the, penal all of the crimes named where the situation is serious will carry a serious maximum sentence. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Well, Mr. Speaker, according to the Public Health Agency of Canada, the supply of fentanyl is a key factor in their just released projections of the rising number of opioid-related deaths that Canadians should expect to see over the next six months. At the very same time, this Liberal government is trying to eliminate jail time for the very people charged with producing, importing and trafficking fentanyl. Can the Minister of Justice tell Canadians why his government is trying to make life easier for the drug producers and traffickers fueling the opioid crisis? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, once again, I would ask the opposition to stop misleading Canadians. Serious drug traffickers, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for letting us know. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, people charged with, with serious drug crimes, with trafficking, with importing, Mr. Speaker, will always face serious consequences in our criminal justice system. That is simply the case. All the minimum mandatory penalties do, Mr. Speaker, is uh, clog up the system, is increase systemic racism and the impact of systemic racism within the system. Mr. Speaker, the statistics show that the opposition's policy of tough on crime is an abject failure and we're going to move beyond it and treat health problems as health problems and criminal justice problems as criminal justice problems. Mr. Speaker, they're doing, they're doing just the opposite. 
4,000 opioid-related deaths by June. That's the projection wow. just announced yesterday by this government's own agency. That's not just a number. That's 4,000 Canadians who have families, friends, and plans for the future. The opioid crisis has affected the communities of every single member of this House. Will this government finally consider the victims of this crisis over their efforts to eliminate jail time for the criminals importing, producing, and trafficking here, here. these deadly drugs. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to our colleague for asking this very important question. He is right. The opioid crisis is a terrible crisis. On, on average, about 20 people die of it every day. So that's why we need to do things that take into account all sorts of measures that are going to be helpful and save lives. We are uh, putting into place in collaboration with provinces and territories and municipalities measures to reduce harm, reduce risk, provide safe provision, safe safe access to safe drugs, work that we uh, also work with provinces and territories to make sure that they have access to, to services. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Granville. Monsieur le Président, les électeurs de ma circonscription. Mr. Speaker, voters in my riding in Vancouver Granville have felt the effects of COVID-19 in all aspects of their lives. But thanks to this government's prudent fiscal management, we are seeing strong economic recovery. Can the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance tell this House about some of the measures included in the last economic statement, which will continue to buttress the recovery? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. What we have learned over the last 21 months is that the most important economic policy is a solid health policy. In the economic and fiscal update, I announced $2 billion to buy therapeutics for COVID-19, $1.7 billion for rapid tests, $7.3 billion to buy booster doses. That is what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Kamloops Thompson Caribou. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Veterans Affairs Canada is cutting caseworkers in March, despite veterans and their families waiting up to two years for the benefits that they're entitled to. Last year alone, their department left over $635 million totally unspent. This is not helping veterans. When will this government take action and address the veterans care crisis? The Honourable Minister. Sir, as she's well aware, we have made a, a number of investments in Veterans Affairs, and we have hired over 400 caseworkers. And as been indicated in our platform, we will make more. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to ask the minister if he's got a headset uh, handy, if he could use it. Uh, I'm sorry. Do not. I'm sorry if the Honourable Minister has a headset handy, if he can use that for the answer. Doesn't have one? Okay, uh, the Honourable uh, Government House Leader, uh, Thank just you, Mr. one Speaker. moment. Uh, on this side of the House, we know how important it is to invest in veterans. That's why we reversed the cuts that we saw in veterans' offices right across this country as we watched the essential services that veterans, that veterans were getting be cut. And one moment, uh, I believe the interpretation has stopped. So I'll ask the Honourable Government House Leader. As it started again, est-ce que l'interprétation a commencé? It started again, we're good. I'll let the Government House Leader start from the beginning uh, and answer that question, please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Dans ce côté, on comprend. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we understand the service of our veterans, and we know that some need help. It's unfortunate that cuts have been made to their services. French for cuts, but I'll tell you something. What was done to our veterans was absolutely unacceptable. We are going to be there for our veterans every step of the way, making sure that we restore those cuts and support them. Yeah. 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 
Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Member for Beauce. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Agriculture signed an agreement with Quebec in August in order to increase the rate of temporary foreign workers in agri-food from 10 to 20 percent. Unfortunately, nothing has happened since then. Excel d'Or, the biggest poultry slaughterhouse in Quebec, is lacking up to 300 workers, which means that chicken are being chickens are being culled. They're being sacrificed, as is producers' income. A question for the minister: When will the 20 percent rate be applied in Quebec? The honourable minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'd like to reassure my colleague. The agreement with Quebec was signed last summer. It was a first step. Quebec is working with the unions as requested. Having done that, it spoke to the Minister of Labor, which accepted the request. So the procedure is underway. And I'm looking forward to the time when our agri-food companies can take advantage of this uh, opportunity to hire up to 20 percent temporary foreign workers. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lille, Camorasca, Rivière du Loup. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're hearing a lot about procedures and processes, but Sébastien Charrois, a poultry producer in my riding, is at the end of his rope. He can't find anyone to transport chickens from his farm to the slaughterhouse because these transportation companies can't uh, get temporary foreign workers on time. So I have a simple question. Tens of thousands of chickens might be culled as a result of this. What will this government do in order to fix the situation and ensure that temporary foreign workers can put an end to this? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our temporary foreign workers programs are extremely important, especially for the agri-food and agricultural industry. In collaboration with the Ministers of Labor and Immigration, we are working hard to move forward in a reform of the system. We want to recognize good employers, which is the vast majority of employers in the agricultural sector. We want to speed up the prom process and increase the rate of temporary foreign workers in these companies. Thank you. Agent Court. For a, a Scarborough agent court? Honourable member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Mr. Speaker, since my motion 103 in 2017, we've changed the conversation so that no federal lever, leader can ever pretend that Islamophobia is not a threat. We've made progress since then, including a national summit earlier this year. But as long as Muslim Canadians fear for their safety in the workplace or walking down the street, we have to do more. Can the Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion please tell this House what the government is doing to continue combating Islamophobia in Canada? Here. Minister for Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Islamophobia is real and a troubling fact. That is why uh, earlier this past summer we held a national summit on Islamophobia to hear directly from community members about their lived experiences, but also taking concrete steps on how we can assist them further. I am pleased to inform the Honourable Member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, that we will take further action, including dedicated resources to tackle Islamophobia and working with Muslim Canadians on the appointment of a special representative to tackle Islamophobia. On this side of the House, we will continue to fight hatred in Canada to keep communities safe, Mrs. Speaker. For North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, seniors across this country who had their GIS cut off can't afford food, medicine, heat, rent. Some of them are already homeless and some of them are at risk to be homeless soon. For months, the NDP asked this government to fix the problem. Finally, there was an announcement that gave seniors across this country hope for a one-time payment. Sadly, today we found out that payment isn't coming till May. This government should be ashamed. Seniors are losing everything and they are doing nothing. When will the Prime Minister stop turning his back on the seniors of this country? 
Honourable Minister for Seniors. Mr. Speaker, since day one, our government has prioritized being there for the most vulnerable. For low-income seniors with the greatest need, Mr. Speaker, we have increased the OAS and GIS. Mr. Speaker, we know during the pandemic, working seniors needed income support, and they shouldn't be penalized for it now. That's why, Mr. Speaker, our government is making a major investment through a one-time payment for seniors who have had their benefits affected. Mr. Speaker, seniors can be rest assured. We will always be there for them. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, back in 2015, the Liberals promised to end all boil water advisories in First Nation communities within five years. Yet today, 42 advisories remain in 30 communities. A recent Parliamentary Budget Officer report calls out a significant gap. 138 million more is needed in annual operating spending. When will the government allocate the resources necessary to fulfill their 2015 promise and ensure that every First Nation community has what every person in Canada deserves, access to clean drinking water? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I can reassure you that this government has every intention of working hand in glove with Indigenous communities to raise all long-term boil water advisories. And Mr. Speaker, our work is paying off. In fact, 74% of long-term boil water advisories have been lifted since we've been uh, in, in government. In fact, we have another 16% of long-term boil water advisories under construction. And Mr. Speaker, we won't rest until we get this done. That's all the time we have for question period today. And uh, we have a point of order, the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. We all recognize that the fact that a lot of people are now.